Shabbat shalom, friends. Grace and peace be upon you, and welcome to another in our study from the Torah. This week's Torah portion is called Pinchas, or as he is known by his English name, Phineas. And Phineas was a priest, the grandson of Aaron. Now, Hashem made a covenant of peace with Pinchas because of the incident at Baal Peor. If you remember in our last Torah portion, we saw where Balak had commissioned Balaam to curse Israel, but they could not curse who God had blessed. And so as a result, Balaam gave Balak instructions as to how he could get Israel to sin. According to the rabbis, he told Balak that if he had a feast to his gods and invited Israel to come, then they could get Israel to fall under the wrath of Hashem. Now in this week's story portion, we see where a Midianite woman and an Israelite man were committing immorality right in the camp. And Phineas defended Hashem's honor by striking them. And not only did he uh, uh, defend Hashem's honor, but he was able to halt the plague that had broken out in the camp. And God, because of Phineas's actions, made a covenant of peace with him. Now, in our study this week, we're going to be talking a little bit about the lust of the eyes. And I pray that it will be a very edifying and challenging in some instances teaching and that the Ruach HaKodesh will minister to each and every one of us by means of the word that he has placed upon my heart to share with all of us today. Now, here's another very interesting fact about Pinchas. I don't know if you're aware, but the name Pinchas actually means dark-skinned or Nubian. So it's telling us something about Pinchas. It's telling us that Pinchas had dark skin. And I found that this bit of information was just very, you know, useful and enlightening. Now, today we are going to begin with a scripture that is found in 1 John 2, 15 through to 17. And this is what it says over there. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, in John's letter, he is actually writing to Israelites who had come to faith in Yeshua the Messiah, but by this time they were scattered in different places. And so he is writing this letter to those who were his students, his disciples. Now, John is writing about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he is basing his letter off of the Torah commands. So let us look, for example, at the lust of the eyes. Where would the commandment to not 
allow the lust of the eyes to take control of an individual come from. We find this in Exodus chapter 20 verse 17, which says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So this is actually a Torah command. Do not covet. Do not allow the eyes to cause you to lust after things that really don't belong to you. Now, one of the reasons why Israel kept falling into sin was because they kept allowing themselves to be drawn away by what they could see and did not allow themselves to be led by the spirit of Hashem. They did not allow themselves to be led by the word of Hashem. And this is one of the reasons why Israel kept falling into sin. Now, this... Uh, temptation of following after the lust of the eyes is something that we find all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The scriptures tell us that when the serpent approached Eve about the fruit, she looked at the fruit and she saw that the fruit was pleasant to look at, it was desirable for food, and it was also desirable to make one wise. And so the truth is that we as human beings, I don't know if you want to call it innate, we have an innate nature, right, to be moved by the things that we see with our natural eyes. Now when we come to faith in God, we have to work very hard to bring the natural temptation or the natural desire to go after the things that we see under subjection to the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, with that said, I'd like for us to go over to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we're going to see one of the occasions where Israel allowed their eyes or the lust of their eyes to cause them to fall into grave sin and how that would impact Israel. We're going to read 1 Samuel 8 from verse 1. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after this honest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from this, the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. It says in verse 10, Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take from his own use or for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. 
When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, Everyone go back to his tongue. So here the people went to Samuel and they said to Samuel, Give us a king to lead us, a king like all the other nations have, so that this king will be able to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles for us. But the scriptures tell us that Samuel was very upset about the fact that the people asked for a king. Now, why would Samuel be upset about the fact that the people asked for a king? Well, up to this point, Israel was led by judges. There was no monarchy in Israel. And so Samuel was Israel's judge and he was getting older and he had put his sons in charge. He had made them judges. But as the scriptures tell us, his sons didn't walk in the ways of Hashem. And so the people said, we want a king. So the fact that the people said that to Samuel was a rejection of him and also a rejection of his sons, which in reality is a rejection of him. And so he was upset about it, but there was more. And we will talk about that a little later. Now the scriptures tell us that he went to Hashem. Hashem said, listen, don't feel badly about this because the people are not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. I want us to take a look at Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 17, because in Deuteronomy chapter 17, as Moses was giving his farewell speech, he told the people that they would want a king and he laid down certain Torah commands for the king. So we're going to take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. And we're going to read from verse 14 to verse 20. It says, when you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it. And you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of the law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. And do not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. So from before Moses left, Moses said, when the people get over into the land, the people are going to ask for a king. But he gave certain stipulations. He said, the king has to be someone who God himself will appoint. The king has to be someone who is not materialistic. He can't desire many horses because if he desires many horses, you're going to have to go to Egypt because Egypt is where we get horses, right? So he's going to have to go to Egypt. He's going to have to go into, again, an alliance with the Egyptians. And God has said you should not go that way again. So he shouldn't have a lot of chariots. He shouldn't have a lot of horses. He should not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Why? Because all of these things are materialistic. And he said the, the, the issue of going to Egypt for horses is to ensure that the king will have military power. It must not be somebody who is going to desire military power or going to desire a lot of wealth or should I say be driven by these things. He says in verse 18, 
When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests, and he is to read from it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of his law and his decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. So Moses said, Israel's ideal king will be a king that God himself will choose. He cannot be led by a desire for power or a desire for wealth, but he must be someone who is highly spiritual. The king has to be someone who is led by the spirit and not by the flesh. He says he has to learn the law live by the law, read the law all the days of his life and obey God's commandments. Then he will revere God. Why was this so important? Because isn't a king supposed to be someone who is a strong military leader who can lead the people into numerous victories and, and so on and make sure that his kingdom is a thriving, prosperous, wealthy kingdom? Isn't that what kingship is supposed to be about? Not by Moses' standards. Moses says the king who God gives to Israel must be a king who is a spiritual king because if the king is materialistic, he is going to lead the people into materialism. However, if the king is a spiritual king, he will be able to elevate the people spiritually. And that's what makes a good leader, Moses says. That's what's going to make a good king. One who is spiritual, who can lead the people in righteousness and justice. And righteousness and justice are the foundations of creation and also of God's throne, right? So whoever is going to be king over Israel must lead in righteousness and justice. Now with this said, I want us to go back over to 1 Samuel chapter 8. So the people said to, to Samuel, Give us a king who will be able to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. You know, a king like what the other nations have. So that people will be able to look at us and be able to say, well, that's a powerful nation with a powerful king. So the Lord said to Samuel, tell them what's going to happen to them under the king that they will choose. In other words, God was saying to them, if you choose a king who is led by the physical, right? This is what is going to happen to you. This king will take your sons and your daughters. He will make your sons run after his chariots and horses. They will run in front of his chariots. Some will be assigned to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to become perfume makers and cooks and bakers. And he will, he will tax you. He's going to take your fields and your vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. You're going to have to give him a tenth of your grain and your wine. And you are also going to have to give him a tenth of your cattle and a tenth of your flocks. And you will become his slaves. You see, this is what the world system does, right? Takes and takes and takes and takes and takes. And... God said to the people, you will become his slaves. The people said, that's okay. We just want a king like what we see the other nations with. One who can go out to battle for us. You see, Samuel as a prophet was a spiritual leader in Israel. It wasn't about materialism or power or military might or anything like that. Besides, Israel already had a king. 
in Hashem. And Hashem was the king who was a spiritual king, right? One who judged in righteousness and justice and gave them the Torah and one who went out and fought their battles for them. God had given Israel many military victories, but no, that wasn't enough. They wanted a king that they could see with their eyes and a king that the other nations could see. It wasn't enough for them to have a spiritual king. And so Israel got Saul. And this was the issue that Samuel had with Saul. Saul was a military man. He was a warrior. He was a Benjamite. But he wasn't a spiritual man. He didn't obey God's commandments. And Saul did not have the capacity to elevate Israel spiritually. Saul did not possess the ability to bring Israel up as a spiritual people. And this is teaching us something this week because we have to recognize that while the nations will be led by the physical things. And the people who don't know God are led by what they can see. We have to recognize as the people of God that we have been called to be led by something higher. And every time Israel allowed their eyes to lead them, they fell into sin. It was the same thing with the spies that we discussed just the other day. The spies went over into the land and although they were powerful, distinguished, righteous men, they were led astray by what they saw with their eyes. And you know, I'm reminded of what we read in the Brit Hadashah when Yeshua was in the wilderness and he was being tempted by the enemy. The enemy took him up and said to him, look, at all the kingdoms of the world. On a spiritual level, it is said that the enemy took him up, took him up into the spiritual realm because that would be the vantage point, realistically, for him to see all the kingdoms of the world. So even though the scripture says that he took him up on a spiritual level, he took him up into the realm of the spirit and showed him the kingdoms and said to him, all of this I will give to you if you do one act of worship. In other words, he was trying to use the power of the eyes to get Yeshua to worship him, to get Yeshua to fall into sin. Right? Because it's always about what we can see with our eyes. You see, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And when we see with our eyes, what we see with our eyes, if we allow ourselves to covet it, to desire it, it will seep into our hearts and take root and it will pollute the soul, right? It will cause us to desire things that are not able to elevate our souls, things that are able to destroy us as opposed to elevating us. And that was what happened with Israel. Now, after Saul, God gave Israel a king who he called a man after his own heart. And the scriptures tell us why God said that David was a man after his own heart. He said, David will do everything that I tell him to do. In other words, David was in pursuit of the heart of God. David, although he was a military power powerhouse, although he was a mighty warrior, David's heart was for the things of God. He was a spiritual king. And this is why David has left a legacy for Israel and a legacy not only for Israel, but for all the world, because everybody knows about the Psalms, even people who are not believers, 
They know that if there is an issue, go and read the book of Psalms and you can find comfort and you can get encouragement and you can, you can, you can, you know, find protection and all of these different things from the book of Psalms. You see, David was a worshiper and David recognized that's what, that what is important is the spiritual. So he left us a spiritual legacy a legacy of songs and prayers that we use to worship Hashem today. He was the person who desired to build God a house, who desired to build God a temple. He was the person who organized the Levites in the way that they were supposed to serve in the house of Hashem and all of these different things, right? Not only that, it is through David's lineage that Israel would get her ultimate king who would elevate Israel spiritually. This is why Yeshua is the one who was able to deal with the um, issue of sin and to grant us freedom and liberty from the power of sin and death. Because this is the ultimate elevation of the human soul. It's the ultimate elevation of the human soul. So God's desire for Israel was more than just material. God's desire for Israel was that Israel would become a spiritual powerhouse, a kingdom of priests unto God, a people who would be able to elevate this realm, elevate this world, to bring this world up because when we are spiritual people, we are ele we're able to elevate wor the, the world around us. We're able to elevate those around us. And this is how Israel would serve as this kingdom of priests unto Hashem. But Israel's downfall was always about going after what they could see with their natural eyes. And this is why Yeshua said in the Brit Hadashah, we cannot serve two masters at the same time. We cannot, we cannot desire to be like the nations and also want to love God because he says we're going to love one and despise the other. We don't have the ability to, to love both. Now, I want us to take a look at this week's Torah portion because in this week's Torah portion, what we're going to learn is that there is a connection between the lust of the eyes and what happened to Israel at Baal Peor. We're going to pick up in chapter 25. We're going to read from verse 10. It says, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron and the Kohen, turned back my wrath from upon the children of Israel when he zealously avenged my vengeance among them. So I did not consume the children of Israel in my vengeance. Therefore, say, behold, I give my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his offspring after him a covenant of eternal priesthood, because he took vengeance for his God, and he atoned for the children of Israel. Now, right off the bat, we're learning here, that Phineas was zealous for God. And this zeal caused him to act. When everyone else was standing because of what they saw happening, right? Phineas acted. So it says in verse 14, the name of the slain Israelite man who was slain with the Midianite woman was Zimri, son of Salu, leader of a father's house of the Simeonites. And the name of the slain Midianite woman was Cosby, daughter of Zer, who was head of the peoples of a father's house in Midian. Now, you know, it's interesting to note here because in the matter of Dina, remember when Dina was violated by the leader of um, Shechem, right? It was Simeon and Levi who had formed an alliance and had massacred the men of Shechem. But here, Phineas, a Levite, took a stand against a Simeonite to defend the honor of Hashem. And I think that's very important because although 
uh, historically, there was a, an alliance between Simeon and Levi. Phineas broke away from that and he decided to defend the honor of God against a Simeonite. Not only that, this woman, Cosby, she was a daughter of Zer, who was a leader of her father's house. So this was a Midianite princess. And there could have been serious, serious backlash for killing a Midianite princess. But because he was zealous to defend Hashem, and because he was moved by the spiritual, because his heart was for the things of God, Phineas acted, and Hashem said, I will make a covenant of peace for him and his offspring. It tells us too that when we are, when we go after the things of Hashem, Hashem will not only bless us, but the blessings will trickle down to our descendants even. And the scripture tells us that there was a plague that broke out among the people and many died that day. Now here we have again another situation where the lust of the eyes caused Israel to fall. Because this is why Balaam was able to say to Balak, have a feast. Because Israel's downfall and Israel's desire was to always be like the nations. So when they saw the Midianites having a beautiful party, and even though they knew that it was a feast for their pagan gods, and even though they knew that there was a lot of immorality that happened in the name of religion at some of these religious feasts, they still were drawn away drawn away by how the Midianites worshipped their God, drawn away by how the women looked, drawn away by a desire to fit in, drawn away by a desire to be like the nations. And so Balaam, knowing this, was able to say, this is how you will be able to get them. Now the enemy doesn't have any new tricks and he's still using our fleshly desires and the lust of our eyes to cause us to go after the things of the world. So here are some questions for us today. Are we more driven by what we see with our eyes than we are driven or zealous as Phineas was for the things of God? Do we desire to excel materially more than we desire to strive and excel spiritually? There are so many persons today who, you know, all they think about is career and wealth and possessions and what's going to happen in the future. And I need to make sure that I have this and I need to make sure that I have that but spend so little time pursuing the things of God. As a matter of fact, John said to the people when he was writing this passage of scripture that we opened with, that it is really only what we do for God that will last. But then we go through life desiring so much of what the world has to offer, desiring so much of what we see with our eyes, as opposed to desiring the things of God, the things of the spirit. Do we prefer the world's system of rulership and kingship as opposed to Hashem's way of doing things? And as I'm talking here, the word that keeps coming to my spirit is a comparison. Because it is the lust of the eyes that cause us to compare ourselves a lot to the people around us. And usually the end result of that is unhappiness. And sometimes it also leads to grave sins that can destroy us. 
So we see people excelling or we see people acquiring certain things and we don't see those things coming our way and so on and so forth. And it is because we allow our eyes to lust and those things stay there and they fester. A lot of times people are walking around very, very unhappy because comparison is a thief and comparison will destroy us. So today, I believe that the word that Hashem is sending to all of us is that we are to guard our eyes and our hearts. Because all of these things, if we are not careful, can affect us and can affect us or will affect us negatively if we don't learn how to master these things. And this is why we have the Ruach HaKodesh. We have the Ruach HaKodesh who is there to strengthen us and to help us to stand against these uh, temptations that come to bombard us. And sometimes it can be just simple things like desiring to eat the way that the world eats because it's easier. Desiring to live the way that the world lives because it's easier. And it has the appearance of having more freedom. A lot of times people believe that God's way is very restrictive. And so the enemy wants us to believe that the world's way is free. You can live how you want to live and date how you want to date and date who you want to date and marry who you want to marry. All of these different things. But we have to guard our eyes and our hearts. Now, I want to share with you a couple of other scriptures about uh, the eyes and the lust of the eyes. And the first one is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. And this is what it says. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So here Yeshua was teaching about the higher dimension of the covenant of, or of the commandment not to commit adultery. Right. So the Torah says, do not commit adultery. Yeshua says, adultery is more than just a physical act. He said, adultery, right, is also spiritual. So he says, if you even look at a woman with lust, then you have committed adultery in your heart. You see, he came to elevate Israel higher than the physical. And so those of us who are believers in Messiah and who have the spirit have to understand that we have been elevated to walk at a higher level than just the physical. And this should really be what guides us every day, every single day, every decision that we make, every desire that we have. Is this something that is going to elevate me spiritually or is this something that is going to destroy me spiritually? Or this is something that's going to bring me down spiritually? Now, another scripture is Proverbs 27, 20. Over there it says, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied. The grave is never satisfied. Nor are the eyes of man ever satisfied. So here's what we have to understand. We have a tendency as human beings right? To always be looking and seeing the things that we lack or the things that we want more of. But as God said to Cain, sin is crouching at your door, but you must master it. We have the power to master it. And we have the power to say no, especially since we have been given the Ruach HaKodesh. We have the power to master it. So even though the eyes have a tendency not to be satisfied, we must learn how to bring the eyes 
into subjection to the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, let's look at Job. Job chapter 31 verse 1 says, Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? When Job was talking to his friends and he was de defending his his righteousness, he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. A lot of us need to make a covenant with our eyes. Right? The spiritual eyes must be opened so that we can have mastery over the physical eyes. James 1, 14 to 15, this is what it says over there. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And the last one that I want to share with us is the one that we opened this teaching with. And it is 1 John 2. 1 John 2 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. A lot of times, even friendships, you know, how do we choose our friendships? Because one of the things that I learned very early out is... And I'm not saying that we can't have um, relationships with people who are not believers and so on and so forth. But we have to be careful, right? Even with our friendships. Because if we have friends who are led by the eyes, what's going to happen to us? there is a possibility that they will soon draw us into being led by the lust of the eyes also. So John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. For anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We cannot love the world and love God at the same time. For everything in the world, everything, everything, the lust of the flesh. We live in a world where we're being told to do what feels good. To chase after pleasures. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And then he said, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Only what we do for God will last. So today is a great day for us to remember that it was the lust of the eyes, a desire to be like the nations, to be like the people around them, to fit in that caused Israel to fall into the Midianite trap. It was the desire and the lust of the eyes that caused Israel to ask for a king who could judge them and lead them into battles like the nations of the world because they wanted to fit in. It is the lust of the eyes that caused Eve to fall into the snare of the enemy because she wanted to satisfy her flesh. She wanted wisdom. She wanted supernatural knowledge. She, she wanted all of those things. And she saw that this fruit would taste good, but it would also elevate her. It really happened because of the eyes and the desire of the heart. And so the word of Hashem to us today is to guard the eyes and guard the heart and do not follow after the things that we see. You know, this is a walk of faith. This is a walk of faith. And this is why the scriptures tell us that without faith, without 
being able to see with the spiritual eyes, without being able to operate at a higher level, right? It's impossible to please Hashem. Everything about this walk is about spirituality. Everything about this walk is about spirituality. And it is walking by faith and seeing with eyes of the spirit that is going to lead to us having a place in the world to come. It's the same reason why Israel rejected Yeshua as Messiah because Israel was looking for a king where they could see his military power and because he's a son of David, right? They could see certain things, power, influence, you know? But no, he came riding on a lowly donkey to elevate Israel spiritually. And we know that when when Yeshua returns, he's returning as a mighty warrior. He's returning as the warrior king, right? But Israel missed the point because it was never about physicality. It was always about spirituality. That was God's desire for Israel as a, for, with a, for a king. And before I go, as I was reading First Samuel chapter 8, you know, and when Samuel said, you're asking for a king with like the nations, you know, and he said, your king that you're asking for is going to oppress you. He's going to take your sons, your daughters. He's going to make you make weapons of war. And he's going to tax you heavily. And he's going to do all of these different things to you. And he's going to enslave you. I couldn't help but going to the anti-Messiah. Because that is going to be the ultimate evil king. That Israel is going to believe that this is their king. The promised king. Not only that, remember, Israel got a number of evil kings with the anti-Messiah being the last evil king. When we allow ourselves to be led by our, our eyes, it can have implications for us, but it can also have such long lasting effects. When Israel asked Samuel for a king, that was how many thousands of years ago? Right, But even to the point in the future when the last king arises, based on the world system, that came from Israel desiring a king that they could see with their natural eyes or a king that could fulfill their, their fleshly desires. That thing. Is going to last all the way until the rightful king comes and takes his place. So, with all of that said, have a great rest of the Shabbat. Just a reminder to you that we have a biblical obligation to present a special offering to Hashem every Shabbat. If you would like to know how to do so, the information is in the description box below. Until we meet again, Shabbat Shalom and Kol Tov. Thank you.